Welcome back to Prime Your Midlife. And today we're going to talk about something that is important to all of us, which is the value of relationships, both professionally and personally. And I guarantee you that if you watch to the end, you will have a minimum of 10 great habits to enable you to have enduring, long, healthy relationships. And to help us do that today, we've got Nick Rion today, who is a professional and personal relationship coach. Nick, welcome to the digital format today of interviews. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. And pleasure to be here, Chris. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And let's cut to the chase. When people talk about the longest study ever in humanity as to what makes people happy, the value of their relationships as they get older and older is the most important thing. And also is the thing that people value most. So this conversation above anything else in terms of AI is so imperative, Nick, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's what I always say. Um, we can, as human being, we can live and survive without relationship, but thanks to relationship, we thrive right we we can't look for happiness in our relationship we need to look for happiness in ourselves and in the sense that we don't need but we thrive with relationships right um i i do believe that life is much better uh much happier to live with relationship with happy and fulfilling relationships well I need you to establish a relationship with the listener or the viewer. And there's probably somebody suggesting that, well, if I was sitting down with a doctor asking him or her to fix my health problem, Nick, a challenge to you is what gives you the right or the qualification or the presence to be able to help other people with their relationships? Yeah, absolutely. So, I have a bit of a, a story to tell, obviously. Um, mostly, if you talk about the short part, answering your question around qualification, I'm a professional coach. Um, that's my qualification. But I think what's more important is the second part, which is my experience, right? Um, so in, in long story short, I grew up um, in a family of uh, wine producers and farmers in Burgundy, France. I am French. Um, and I don't know, do you know anything about that context of environment? Well, I would only be guessing on the basis that if there's wine, it could be alcohol, which could lead to intoxication, which could lead to conflict. But I I'm guessing. <laughs> that, that, that could be, but I think uh, more importantly, farmers and and one producers and one i say that is with the utmost um respect towards them um they're very connect very much connected to the land uh and that also means that those type of people they don't have the most um uh, the the biggest familiarity with everything that runs around emotions and and communication right they're not the most communicative people uh, and they're not the most self-aware people just because of how they grew up the environment that they grew up in they grew up in right and that i i'm no exception to that that means that um i grew up in a family that was not very good at communicating all this not very good at uh creating relationships i would say intentionally right um my my mother was a bit exception to that um she was the most sensitive to uh to the family and i i like to say that i you know i i take a, bit, a lot of my character from her um and until i was 12 uh, i was kind of shielded uh from that right but i said 12 because that's the that's when she passed away and I had to handle um, the relationship with my uh, my father and and my brother, right? Um, 
the first thing that I've done is I avoided conflicts. I avoided, you know, hard conversations and I, I, I felt I would just not, you know, uh, I would just uh, protect myself. Right. And that I did, and I would pretend to be fine with it. I would look strong as much as possible and, and pretend that doesn't affect me. Right. And that I did until I was around in my early twenties when, um, I went into a period where, um, I, I so much tried to be someone else to fit that I went into uh, a depression. And that's when I realized that, and, and for what, because in my relationships, I was forcing myself. I was trying to be someone else. I was trying to, to fit. And that's when I realized, okay, that is not the way either. There's another way of doing this. And that's my, where my research started. Right. And over 10 years plus that went after that, I, I, I researched into how can I build relationships that are fulfilling to me, right? Obviously to, to me and to the other people that I have a, a relationship with. Um, that led me to, through, you know, my career went from a software engineering, which is in the past and change management, which is a, an environment, which I, I'm sure, you know, or you guess, um, uh, brings a lot of conflicts. Um, and where I learned a lot as well into, in terms of how to kind of build a relationship that, you know, allow change. And then, um, I ended up starting being a coach because that's what I was always kind of passionate about. And that's what I want to help people with. So that's my experience. Um, now what's important in, in this is this is what I'm passionate about, the people interaction and why is because this is not difficult building relationships and, and that are fulfilling that are, um, that make any conflict easy to solve. It's not difficult. The only problem is we just don't know how we don't have the tools. So I built myself with those tools and now I want to share them. I'm interested in that journey from 12 to your early twenties. What were the consequences of you masking your emotions or not facing into the, the, the relationship with yourself? Mm. Was it conflict with people? Was it an internal health problem that you then realized that you were suffering or tell us about what those consequences were over that period of time? The consequences, the consequence really is unhappiness and, and that, that sense of, um, that anxiety that grew and grew to a point that it was unbearable. Trying to fit and, and forgetting yourself, forgetting your values, what you stand for, your needs, forgetting all that to try and fit in, you know, whatever context you are environment you are into the relationship that you have with it. at the time for me it was with my family and with my friends as well that hurts that creates a lot of um that creates distress and you can feel it that created a lot of anxiety that's you know if you keep that coming and it's it piles up and piles up to a point where um you just can't stand it it's a bizarre story you tell about that stereotypical French farmer in at one with the land in that the vision that I kind of have in my head is one of a, a healthy vision of sun and farming and the family sitting down with some cheese and some wine and talking about the harvest. It's peculiar that the, the, the vision in my head is very different to how you experience it and also perhaps how it actually really is. is is that fair no i don't think um i don't think we should paint it all black mm -hmm. um i think definitely it's a very positive um it's, it's still a positive environment to grow up in 
um, the values that I get um, that I have, they come from that environment. I, I have no, absolutely no, um, you know, I, I don't blame anyone in this story. Uh, this is just the way that it happened. And um, what I would say is that this is a reflection of, it's not the, env the only environment where um, uh, people don't know how to talk about emotions and, and um, you know, don't know how to talk about what they need, etc. It's not the only environment, but this is one where um, it's particularly present. Um, and, and, you know, it could be, I'm sure there are uh, families of farmers and, and, uh, and wine producers that uh, have very, are very sensitive and, and do, do, uh, education and, and, uh, emotional intelligence in, in a very good way. So it's just that this is what I found, um, that it was very present in those, in this environment. But the sun, the sunny, you know, and the, the, the grape, um, the harvests, the, um, all the winemaking and all that is still, I guess it would be idyllic for, for a lot of people. Uh, I grew up in it, so I'm not so much so impressed by it, but, uh, it's still a beautiful environment to, to grow up in. Well, I, I'm not going to detract my vision of going to Burgundy and crushing grapes and sitting down and having it with a nice uh, Roquefort cheese or something. Uh, <laughs> tell me, you have a particular phrase that is making conflict pain-free. Now, that triggers me because the word conflict and pain-free, they just don't seem to be able to have a marriage together <laughs> in that the two, the two ideologies of conflict and pain would seem to be wedded with each other. However, your mission is to make them pain-free. Can you help me understand how that can possibly happen? Yes. So, um, yeah, I like to say my mission is to make conflict, conflicts pain-free. No, we need to define what conflict means. Um, the way I define it is a conflict is a disagreement or conversation, a debate that escalates somehow into something that is a lot more difficult to solve, right? And usually has a lot of emotions in it. What's painful at the end of the day, it's the emotions. So we don't want to remove emotions from the disagreement. There will always be emotion that makes us human. But what you can learn is be com comfortable with the emotions um, and accept them at, as what they are, right? Uh, what I would say is the earlier you solve a conflict, the least painful it's going to be, right? So if you solve it at the disagreement level, then, um, it's, it's not going to be as painful as if you let it uh, linger and, and, and become, become uh, a lot bigger than it should be. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And within your, your research or your own learnings, do you have a particular model? The one that comes to mind is, you know, storm, reform, form, renew, that particular model. Where do you come from in terms of your education and then application of that? Yeah. So, I guess what's important, I, I take, I take, um, I take a different approach. So most of, um, uh, professionals, uh, out there will, uh, take conflicts and try to resolve, mediate conflict. It's not a bad thing. It's, it's a great thing. And I think everyone should understand how to resolve and, and, uh, conflicts easily. Right. Um, my approach is slightly different. What I do is that I prepare the relationships so that conflicts are easily solvable. Right. Well, I don't, I obviously help people with conflicts because that's usually when they come to me because they have conflicts. So it's already 
it's not too late, but um, they come because they have a problem. Now, what I do is I, okay, let's solve that conflict and then let's work on how can we make sure that in the future, the conflicts will be easily solvable because I don't, um, I don't take pleasure in coming back to the same client will, to help them with the conflict. What I want is for them to be equipped and to prepare the relationship so that they can deal with it by themselves. Does that make sense? So that's, that's my approach to it. I prepare the relationship to make it easy. Okay. And, and are you working with the individual who has one side of the conflict or do you like to bring all the parties together? to be able to have a holistic view of the totality of the conflict and then try to create linkages or bonds between the parties so that as a whole, they all fix the conflict together. Yeah. So there's one important thing here. Um, what I do is personal and professional development. So to do that, to enable that, I need to have someone in front of me that is aware that it comes from them, right? So that being said, it could be both parts of the relationship, both parts of, you know, both actors might be able to say, oh, I need to develop myself in that sense. And I, I do as well. Right. Um, but usually there will be, uh, only one person not saying that the other doesn't care. But usually it takes, it takes a lot to decide that. Right. Um, and I can work with only one person that that's fine. Why is because, um, you, by working with one, you will usually, and by experience, inspire the other to change as well. Right. And there's by the words of. Paulo Coelho, uh, you change the world by your actions, not by your opinion. Uh, it's very important that to understand that by changing the way you behave, the others is more, is more likely to, to change as well. So when I come to one of your sessions and I, I am full of my own priorities and purpose and she said, he said, you won't believe just what happened. I'm not to blame. How do you make me take responsibility then for my side of the conflict when mm. I'm coming at you with all this? She said, you won't believe what happened. And then this happened. Because I mean, I have to say, you, you're already coming, bringing a very calm persona to even this conversation. I can imagine yes. you're quite good at bringing things down to quite a, a, a suppressed level. But what are the first kind of questions you would ask me, assuming I come to the screen with lots of conflict, anger, resentment, distrust, disrespect? Mm. Well, this is one, one thing that I'm very good at. It's being with emotions. Um, you say I'm, I'm quite level headed and it's one of the qualities that uh, allow me to be a coach. Um, I'm very good at being with emotions. That means that when this happens, first of all, I, what I can see is that there are a lot of emotions, right? And what I, the first thing I'm going to do first thing before anything else is help the other person go through their emotions. I'm not saying discard them. I'm not saying, um, um, you know, avoid them or, or, you know, look for a better emotion. I'm, I'm saying going through them and not until the person goes through those emotions, we can start working. Right. So you're literally There's... allowing the, the, the vent, the top of the champagne cork almost to be popped and letting it. Yeah. And then I guess you kind of say, so are we done? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's even more, it goes deeper than that. Rant and emotional and processing emotions are two different things. Um, ranting is talking about, you know, all the words that are coming up, right? And it's, it's good too. I'm not saying it's, it's bad or anything is, is good. What well, I'm going a little bit deeper than that. I'm going into processing the emotions. What is it you're feeling? 
what how are you feeling it where right and then feel that emotion feel that anger feel that frustration where is it right and then now let them kind of dig into it and go deeper and deeper why is because emotion is energy in motion until you spot them it's like um uh it's like uh, some insect basically if i can make that comparison it's like not until you kind of spot it and then you you approach your finger to kind of touch it then it's going to fly away it's the same thing with the emotion when you spot it when you see it without any judgment then it goes into something different it 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 moves energy in motion right and so you need to process those emotions first then we can start working what if though the emotions and beliefs are so deeply ingrained because of in your situation when you were 12 or before that the family environment is one that is always conflict orientated there are always arguments in the house there's always anger and the person in front of you has no real understanding of the fact that this is something that is inherently wrong with them because this is the way that they've been brought into the world and this is the way that they have been told that they behave mm. the awareness is behind the wall of emotions once you go through that wall you process you process all of that and it may take a few sessions absolutely because it depends how much we have uh, but once you go through it, then comes the awareness. Because then we can start talking about values and needs. And when people understand those you know, needs that they have and those values that they have, um, they are much more equipped and, and calmer about dealing with the situation. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? A hundred percent, yes. It, but it is, how long is a piece of string? Some people may get it in 40 minutes. Some people may get it in four sessions, 40 sessions before mm -hmm. they're able to take themselves out of the, of the picture that they keep on living and yeah. see that there's a different way of approaching. There's a... Um... Uh, as a coach, I'm, I maintain accountability. Uh, that's the one of the big job of a coach, right? Accountability. Why I'm saying this is because if a person came to me, they came because they wanted to get better, right? Mm -hmm. If a person after a few sessions is still uh, brewing those emotions and kind of calling them back, et cetera, et cetera. I am responsible for bringing it up and saying, I, you have this objective. You have this objective. Where are you in terms of that? Right. You need to move on. Right. If you want, if I, if I want to help you, we need to move on right how am i how are we going to move on right mm -hmm. we can still process emotions and all that they can still come back that's fine but we need to kind of keep uh progressing right two of the foundational words that i saw from your work so far is that you have two pillars of mutual respect and trust that are fundamental with that in mind nick let's just say two people are in a relationship with each other and there is a habit to tell little white lies associated with their behavior or the untruths that sit within their past how does that fit with your ideologies of relationship mm. success little little white lies because we think that we're telling a white lie to protect the other party mm -hmm. absolutely so first of all, um, where does it come from? Um, trust and mutual respect. Why? Uh, I noticed that 
um, it's it's um, the amount of mutual respect and trust that you have a relationship will define the strength of conflict that you can have in this relationship. So I mean, just illustrating that, right? If you have absolutely no trust and no respect, then the smallest conflict is going to be very painful. The smallest one. But if you have a lot of mutual respect and a lot of trust, then, then you can have really strong conflict and they're not going to be that painful. Right? This is equal, basically. Okay? So when you have a painful conflict, then that's probably because you don't have a mutual respect and trust that you should have. And vice versa, if you know that you don't have that respect and trust in the, in the relationship, then maybe you don't want to go into that type of conflict. Okay? So that being said, little white lies. When they're seen, they are... I can, I can imagine that um, they are considered as a break of trust. Right? This is something that anyone um, that wants to develop a relationship, um, you know, with mutual respect and trust, should talk about. This is when, when you have, you know, difficult conversations. Um, assertiveness is very important. If you, I noticed that you lied to me when in this situation, in that situation, and also this situation, if you keep doing this, I won't be able to trust you further. Mm -hmm. And that means that we can't have, you know, this type of relationship that we're having. We're not talking about romantic or, you know, friend, or it can be colleagues as well, you know. Um, so when you have that hard, that difficult conversation, then what do we do? You know, and then you have a conversation. Does that make sense? If a person changes behavior, obviously we we hope that the uh, the trust it, it will go up again right there might be good intention and always start with you know people are doing things are behaving with good intentions so maybe white lies are because they want to protect us or anything like that maybe they don't even know that it, it's hurting us Does that makes sense mm -hmm. but the heart the difficult conversation is very important and business, being assertive is very important well, it sounds like a, a relationship that is built on trust. What happens, though, when people change? And a lot of the audience that are listening to this are potentially facing into or on a midlife journey. And chemical imbalance, hormonal changes, or simply the fact that they can see that there is only so many years left of life and they can see that the partner that they're with may not be the person that they think, that they think they, they could spend the rest of their lives with. What are your suggestions there when one party begins to feel distaste or a lack of affinity with the life partner that they've been with for many, many years, and they begin to doubt whether that person is the right person for their future? Mm. Yeah. So let me just um, go back a little bit and, and put some context here. The biggest problem I believe that we have in society is that we build relationships organically and not intentionally, not consciously, consciously, right? What does that mean? That means that we just build relationships and they go as they go. And when they fail, they fail, right? If you do it conscious, uh, consciously, that is, that is a different thing. Consciously means that, like a plant, and that I've learned from, you know, where I, where I grew up, you have a seed, right? You have a seed. You can call it chemistry, um, you know, trust, or just like um, common interests, right? You have this seed. Now, this is your decision to grow it, to water it to you know remove a little herbs around it so it can uh, thrive right this is your responsibility 
and your behavior will make it so. That makes sense? You grow that relationship consciously. What does that mean? It means that you need to make effort all the time to grow a relationship. And I'm not talking about romantic only. I'm talking about friendships, colleagues, and, and all, all relationships, be professional, personal, right? You need to grow them and you need to put an effort into it. Okay? That's what, but that, that everyone says it, right? Everyone knows that. I think it's important that to remind that. Um, and then, you no, know, coming back to your question is, what if at when you're you know in in your um, midlife you realize that um, the person has changed or you have changed and that relationship doesn't doesn't work anymore right well first of all if you put an effort on that relationship constantly right if you build um, that trust that mutual respect right you will detect it a lot more easily and it's going to be a lot less painful first of all and um what happens here is you have you have that chemistry that love that um that can that can potentially disappear that's that's not uncommon i think but also maybe your need your needs have changed i grew up with the need of fun and and um, lightness i might um evolve into you know wanting a family and stability we're talking needs here okay mm -hmm. fun lightness adventure goes into stability um you know and and etc and so on and so forth so if your need change and the relationship is not compatible with it anymore you if if you are if you build your relationship consciously again you will detect it and then you have a conversation right look my needs have changed this is more this than that i love you if it's a romantic relationship i love you but i have those needs now how like how where are you right and how do we work together and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least you know and you have that conversation. I think it's such a fundamental point is that I'm thinking about your, you know, your seed and I'm thinking, okay, I grew up as a red grape and I'm enjoying growing as a red grape. And then suddenly I look at the twisted vine over the years and think, I, I want to be a white grape. And then we, you know, we tell all the other red grapes that I'm now going to be a white grape. And the assumption is, is that we're now the, the, the odd one out. And we think that is our own problem. But actually by expressing it and talking about the needs, it could be that the person you're with says, hey, that's cool. I want to be a white grape too. Or thank you for telling me. I'm completely at one with your desire to change, but I love you still. How can we find a place where you can be meeting your needs but we can still love each other exactly and that's where um the pain i'm not saying it's not going to be painful because when you even like if you if that relationship needs to change in something that is different and there is love then there's there are emotions but it's going to be much less painful and if you haven't ever worked on that relationship and never been really aware of what you need and what the other needs, um, and and it kind of you know it's like it comes back to you a slap in the face, right? Well, that's just making me think. I was before you even said that slapping of the face that there will be occasions in relationships where it has got to a point that is now harmful for one of the two parties where do you sit on the tolerating of behavior that actually not only doesn't meet my needs, but also affects my own self-respect for myself by mm. staying yeah. with a relationship that is no longer serving me and is also not in keeping with mutual respect of society. Mm. So um, along the um, we haven't talked about it, but along the all the habits that I um, that we um, that I've developed, 
uh, into developing a successful relationship, there's the, the assertiveness habit, right? And that's what you're talking about. When when too many behaviors became become har um, harmful, right? Well, first of all, if you develop that relation that that um, habit, sorry, about being assertive, you're not gonna let too many behaviors harm you. At the first one, you ha you can have that conversation. And why is because in your relationship, your partner or your colleague or your friend is going to be used to have that conversation. Does that make sense? You're not going to wait for three or four or five times. You're going to say it at the first time because you're, the person that is in front of you is used to have that type of conversation with you. And well, so simple. therefore it's not, it, it, it sounds simple having that assertion habit, but if somebody's listening and they are in the middle of a violent, disruptive, domestic relationship, or even a professional relationship where they are being abused verbally or physically, mm -hmm. and they've asserted themselves to say, this has to stop and it continues, but the person themselves keeps putting their hand in the flame by giving them the benefit of the doubt or thinking it or get better. How do you coach assertion to somebody that is almost playing a victim's mentality? So from the context that you're describing, first of all, um, it, what I'm hearing is that it's certainly a bit too late already, right? Because those conversations should have happened a long time ago right uh, if it happens that that's still assertiveness but to the highest point where it you need to be you need to protect yourself mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. if you ask for a change of behavior and it doesn't happen you need to protect yourself right if it harm if it's harmful you need it to change. And that might be, you know, the solution might be relationship needs to stop or there's, there's like, I don't know what the solution can be. Um, it can be many, many uh, things. Uh, but the, the important bit here is um, you can't, assertiveness is not about just saying things. It's also about um, doing what you say. Mm -hmm um you want to do so for example if you say look if you if that happens again i'm sorry but this this need you know we, we won't be doing this again well if that happens you're not going to do this again right you stop entirely yeah right and you keep to your word and to your actions yeah that's assertiveness yeah i, I completely agree i but when you you know, you talk about it's too late. Some people have literally been brought up in an environment where it's considered permissible to be abused verbally or physically. And therefore they think that is the way that life operates. Mm -hmm. 10 habits. And obviously you've given us an idea there of one of them. And I will put in the show notes, all 10. Could you pick out one or two of your favorite habits that you think would be really good to serve the audience to enable long lasting, happy relationships with professionals and personal people. Yeah. I think the, um, um so the, the, those habits are divided in three groups, three categories, right? First one is, um, um, all about self. Uh, so there is self-awareness and self-management. I think my favorite is really self-awareness, um, understanding what's going on in you, your emotions, your values, your needs, understanding that to the, you know, we evolve, so it's going to change and every day is going to be something different. Um, there are patterns, uh, obviously, but you know, it might change. But understanding that and being aware of that when it happens to as much as possible. So, you know, the best is to be like at any time, just being aware of what emotions are going through you. 
that's you know that, that's obviously the perfect way is not um is is not always possible but at least even if it's like you had a conversation and then an hour after you you know introspect a little bit and you'd be like this is how i felt during that conversation just that it wasn't you weren't aware when you had that conversation but at least an hour after that's always a start that makes sense well, it does make sense, but I'm thinking about people who say I haven't got time or I just don't know where to start or uh, it's not me, it's them. What are some what are some simple ways that you think you can rest with your thoughts and you can have that self-reflection? Mm. And I think it's easier when you get older personally to have that wisdom of thought. But what would you advocate being a good principle to try to get people to really take time to understand where conflict has come from. Mm. Well, when it comes to to self awareness, like this is complicated, right? And um, if you haven't uh, grown up in an environment that helps you kind of understand all that, if your parents never asked you, what is it you're feeling right now? ever and if you've never talked about it um it's going to be complicated to voice it right um i've i've done um a training uh, on nonviolent communication that talks a lot about feelings and one way that um we we train uh for for doing that is uh you just uh, have a, a a panel of um emotions so all the emotions you know in english too, obviously but um and then and then you try and determine okay this is the one i'm feeling right now right and the the amazing thing about that is you've got so many kind of shades of emotions it's 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 amazing but you will know what you're feeling if you point to it and you know oh, frustration that's not exactly that and then you see another word and ah oh, yes that that that's it that's it right that's if you were 10 or if you are uh my 10 i'm not sure you are aware of all the, the words but about that age maybe um and if you're 50 that will work okay and it doesn't have to be perfect the exercise is to voice it Right. That's where the, the awareness comes from. So what you asked is like, people don't have a time. Self-awareness is not about conflict, right? So self-awareness is you, how you behave in your life, how, who you want to be, right? So if you don't have time to work on who you want to be, that's where we probably should start. That makes sense. 100 percent so and then and then um just just writing down the emotion on a piece of paper this is how i felt that's it just exer exercising this this practice then we'll kind of bring that it's it's a muscle your muscle will your brain will start to understand how to recognize emotions right the difficulty with emotions is that they, there's a concept that uh, I call emotional flooding. That is when um, your amygdala where all your emotions are stored is flooding your brain, right? And so you can't think, right? You, that's to determine what emotions you're feeling is impossible because you flooded, right? But if you, after that flooding, you 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 go back to it and like this is how i felt you train your brain slowly and slowly how to recognize that emotion and then the more you do it the more you train that muscle the least emotional flooding you're gonna have because as soon as it's gonna happen your brain will be you know trained to recognize it and to stop it that makes sense well, on the basis that relationships are the things that make us happy and also lead to our longest lives, it sounds like something that is definitely worth spending time on. Absolutely. There's there's one um, one thing that I'm going to add to that. 
if you want to have a strong body and confidence and muscles where you want to have your muscles or maybe you want to do it because you know you, you're doing a sport that is important to you like like me you train every day or every uh, other day you go to the gym and you lift weights and and you do that with consistency and discipline you're motivated because you have an objective right it's the same thing for self-awareness it's a muscle that you need to train and if you want to be to have good relationships um if you want to be you know self-aware and and understand who you are and who you want to be with others and how to use all those skills then you need to train and it's it's a little bit every day it's uh, you know it's consistent uh consistency and discipline that was the first bucket of self-awareness moving into what well, what i can see here is habit number five and again i'll share the show notes with everybody to see these make yourself vulnerable now in a position of relationship bliss making yourself vulnerable reading the three words suggests that i'm putting myself in a position of of giving empowerment to somebody else or I'm having a servitude attitude in that I am at the, at the demands of another person using the word vulnerable. Mm. Is that a way I'm seeing it? Or am I looking at this in, in completely the wrong way? Nick? Um, so the way I define vulnerability is more like, um, if you, if you want the other person to trust you, you need to be a vulnerable. It's a, it's, it's as easy as that. If you give them um, a whip, right, and you open your back to them, right, if and you say, you know, do whatever you want with that, that's, you know, that you're trusting them. You're trusting them that they're not going to harm you. This is exactly the case with vulnerability. If you want to trust, if you want someone to trust you, be vulnerable to them because the, the moment you open yourself to them, they will trust you and they will potentially normally open themselves to you. Right. It's all about, um, telling them how you feel and how they can help you. So it's more about having the courage and the honor to be vulnerable with your own emotions and be willing to express that to the, to the other person, to be vulnerable enough to have the bravity to say, this is how I'm feeling. And you can either unpack this as a gift or you can choose to continue to tread all over me, but I'm telling you how I'm feeling mm -hmm. in the moment of vulnerability. And if we trust each other, then you'll accept that as vulnerability, as opposed to using it as a position of strength. Yes. And, and it's not it's um it's a great example yes with emotions it can be something a bit more um tangible as well um say for example um you with your boss i imagine you you work with or you have a boss you have a manager and they ask something of you uh and uh and you're particularly anxious about something that is happening happening in your life um you know that you obviously impacted by say you or you know your your child is sick or you know something that is very deep very then um being vulnerable would mean i'm i'm very impacted by what's happening to me right now i'm you know uh, upset i'm i'm sad i'm um anxious and i don't think i'm going to be able to deliver what you're asking me to deliver that's being vulnerable okay I, yeah i can see that i can see how that it's so important to have that honesty and integrity as opposed to just carrying on regardless and then making a complete mess of it and then perhaps being admonished for it and then you say well however the reason i have failed is because of this and then the other person says well if only you told me i could have understood exactly it's great to hear so much practicality there nick but i'd really like to get into the the, the nitty-gritty of actually somebody that you know that you 
have helped. They came to you in conflict or in stress, anxiety in a relationship. Could you give us an example of somebody that you literally pushed out the door and they were so happy and in a different feeling of comfort with their relationship? Hmm. Um, yeah, so um, those those habits really are, um, I, I separated them because uh, they're easier to work on uh, one by one, but they really kind of work together, right? Um, transparency, vulnerability, curiosity, um, they, they work together. Uh, they work together, especially um, with the ones of the third category, which are specific actions. For example, having a difficult conversation. When you have a difficult conversation, you want to be assertive. You want to be curious about what the other person has to say. Um, you want also to have a learning mindset because you, uh, you want to learn from, you know, your, your, your mistake. You want to uh, come from that mindset so that, um, you avoid the, um, the blaming and you're compassionate towards yourself. So all that. And so like. I can remember a situation where uh, someone was um, uh, have a hard, had a hard time, uh, was very emotionally kind of um, full um, because uh, they couldn't um, have a they didn't know what they was they were in an impasse basically they they didn't know how to solve the situation right and it was an evident um um situation of needing to have a difficult conversation right so the first first thing and as i mentioned at the beginning um go through the emotions right that's that's very important secondly empower the person what the the biggest um issue there is that the person didn't feel like they were equipped um, with what they needed to have to have that conversation. They were they were afraid of losing the other person, um, and and so there was all those things that needed to be like okay, you you need to understand who you are, what you stand for, and those things. As long as you remember those things, you can go into that conversation, and then going to that conversation there were the tools of curiosity transparency learning mindset and all that and and at the end of the day um they they had that conversation and it went well not because they had the tools um they probably participated to it but more because they came into the conversation uh with the right mindset okay and do you give people the tools or do you really want them to discover their own technique to get them to fix themselves? Yeah, the tools are only, they, I didn't invent them. Uh, this is something that, you know, if you, I'm sure if you ask uh, ChatGPT or any AI, they will give you the same tools. So I haven't really, I mean, the only thing that I've done is I compiled them in something that is easy to, to understand and and to practice from right but the real work that i do is to help people that want to work on those habits they want to develop those habits and they 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 you know this not they know how they just need the um the empowerment the accountability the proper actions to do it and, and we work through that. That's my role as a coach. My role as a coach is not to give the tools. Mm -hmm. That's already been done. My role as a coach it is to help them in the process, in the journey of developing those habits. And then we put some actions in place that they uh, decide, and then I make them accountable for it, right? Yeah. In terms of society and relationship breakdown are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of relationships for humanity as a whole 
my I'm always kind of optimistic to be fair but um I mean, compared to 20 years ago, I'd say maybe 30 years ago, um, we have a lot more people talking about emotional intelligence, self-awareness and all that. So I believe we're heading to the right direction. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, um, but we, we're definitely heading in the right direction. How long is it going to take? I don't know, I couldn't say, um, but I believe that we, um, we, we get more and more um, conscious about it. It's like, it's a little bit like the environment. For me, it's one of the, you know, the environment is a, obviously a um, um, society problem uh, to, to solve. Well, when I say the environment is um, obviously um, uh, the global warming and all that um, and I, I do believe that uh, relationships and, and dealing with relationships is also a society um, a problem that, that we you know we may find we may take like our generation um, many generations to solve and I'm not even sure that we need to solve it I think it needs to just evolve and keep evolving yeah, I, I agree. I do believe that we should be more optimistic about it. There's a little bit of cynicism and suggest maybe in four years time, we'll have a an AI driven robot that would understand all of our human needs and our emotional needs. And the lazy human will divert to that rather than <laughs> sitting with a professional relationship coach that's going to take hard work. Mm. I, I think, you know, when I, a little bit of positivity, uh, positivity, when I work with people, I see the change that happens in people. Um, when I work with my clients, I go very deep and, uh, and I see the change. And more often than that, it gives me, you know, um, tears in my eyes when I see them, you know, find the solution, um, evolve, improve and reach their goals, get better. Um, I see people change, I see people improve, I see, I see all that positivity and that just keeps me going. Yeah, and hopefully you're the pattern interrupt on the basis that this is the way that they have been taught to evolve as a child in a family relationship, perhaps. And every time you fix somebody, you're enabling, you know, many seeds to proliferate that are all going to be more conscious, more respecting, more trusting. So what is the phrase? May many blossoms bloom as a result of uh, your work, Nick Rion. Absolutely. What would be three final takeaways? I've got the 10 habits. We haven't gone through them all, but they are on Nick's website and the show notes are in there. And it's very easy to do. You need to give the email so that he can deliver them to you, but they'll be in the show notes. Uh, if anybody's listening on YouTube, uh, Nick, what would be, your website is nicholasrion.com where we can find that. Mm -hmm. and uh 10 10 uh, habits is the the link but if you go to the website nicholas com, you will see a button uh that is getting free guide i think yeah it, super easy uh, i did that this morning and i you know I've, I've got them all here um and i've read them all they're very good they're very good what would be your three main challenges to anybody listening to enable them to work harder on their own habit, their own work of becoming more effective in their relationships, be that personal or professional? Mm. Well, I kind of want to challenge people. This is what I do for, for a living, you know, to challenge people. When people go like, yeah, but this, but that, you know, um, I, I challenge people to um, go further, right? Um, it's a that we can we can invent all the excuses um, that will stop us from being who we are or uh, really truly. Um, I I would say you know just do just one, just one. Maybe change a little bit of your behavior in in any just one relationship. Just engage the person as a change 
or um, or being be curious, ask questions, just a little bit, right? That's one thing. Um, take one and try it and see what happens. Don't take my word for it. Just try it. Um, one thing that I'll say is we have um, ex uh, so expectations. It's very, you know, we have expectations from relationships. Um, and I think one important thing is to uh, define what we expect from those relationships. And what I'm saying by that is if you, first of all, relationships have both depth, so you go deep in a relationship, and breadth, so it's they're wide, right? Now, for example, a relationship can give you uh, fun and also uh, make you learn and um, and and other things or many things, but they don't go very deep in the fun, very deep in the in the learning, right? And then the the relationship they give you only learning, only fun, right? It's important to recognize that relationships have both those dimensions. Why I'm saying that? Because sometimes we expect a relationship to be everything. But they don't have to be everything. Some relationship, they will give you something. Some others will, go, will give you other things. And it's important to be aware of what they bring you and what they, you're expecting from them. Because then you get a lot less uh, frustrated when they don't bring you what you what you want. That makes sense? So that's one thing to consider. Just understanding in all your relationships that you have, um, what you're expecting from them. Just having that awareness. I challenge you to do that. And with that in mind, being authentic with others. So let's just say you were having a, a conflict relationship with your girlfriend partner. Do you think it's wise to also be authentic with others? So if so, if somebody said, hey, Chris, by the way, how's things going with your partner? Do I paper over the cracks or do I tell them the truth? It depends. It depends what kind of relationship you have with that person. Mm -hmm. if, it's, uh, if, if you have a type of relationship where you trust that person and um, you want a deep relationship with them, I suggest you do absolutely absolutely or it can be that look i've got my um issues and it's difficult at the moment life is difficult um we can talk about it maybe not now or something like that but you know i'm willing to be open to you it can be that right but sometimes you know people are like they're just here for fun and they're not here to hear you, your your stories and that's fine too that's where you choose and you decide I really appreciated the conversation today, Nick, and I want to appreciate you for just coming to the screen with such a level of calmness and servitude. You know, you've really given some very nice answers to Gay. It would be remiss of me not to ask if anybody's listening, you can't see this, but behind you, you've got a bag and some and some boards and anybody's going to be saying, oh, come on, Chris, just got to ask the question. What on earth is on the wall and why are they in your background, Nick? Yeah, so I've got, for, for everyone that's not seeing, I've got um, a rack of uh, boards. They are different boards, the um, wakeboards, kiteboards and snowboards. And I've got a big bag. I uh, can't see the others, but those are my kites. Why? Because I'm, uh, I do a lot of kite surfing. That's, um, that's what I do to take care of myself, uh, to what we would say, um, uh, take the pressure out. Uh, I do that in England. So, uh, around, around London. Um, yeah, this is my, my fun activity and, and, and this is my background as well, just to remind me every day of, you know, what, what fun is and looking forward to the next session well hopefully that's helped somebody who has that curious mindset just to think what are those things on nick's wall <laughs> i really appreciated the conversation today nick uh, i wholeheartedly support your message if one person listens to this today or watches and downloads those habits or just takes one of those takeaways away 
and applies it to the next person that they see or the next conversation they have, that would be a, an amazing result for me. I mean, the, the little, the little um, help that it can bring just the little one is always beneficial. And, and uh, that's all uh, I ask really. Well, thank you very much, Nick. And remember, it's one of my five fundamentals in terms of relationship. And I think it knits so many things together. And it's all part of remembering that we have one life. So love life, living life. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Chris.